Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Uh, help us to see that our faith is built on a firm foundation. Uh, we have a good reason to believe the things that we do. And thank you for all of the evidence that you've left behind for us to help continue to build our faith on that foundation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so this week we are doing uh, Jesus Really Died and He Really Rose. Uh, just a quick map to know where we're going. We're talking about both the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so with the crucifixion, we're going to start off with a quick game um, and just do a little bit of mix and match with a partner around you and just see what order the events happened in. And uh, we're going to go through a little bit of the text of the crucifixion, and then I'm going to provide uh, some of the medical diagnos diagnoses of what happened to Jesus. And uh, just a quick disclaimer, as we go through this, um, Jesus did say, uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Um, you know, he wants us to have a sensitive heart. And so if you are blessed with that and uh, would be a little bit averse to hearing about some of the graphic details of a crucifixion, which is a torturous death, um, especially of our Lord, uh, if you do want to step out and just head into the commons when we do the game side of this with some of the mix and match when everyone's talking, um, or if you're viewing online, if you want to skip forward to a certain part of the video, we'll start talking about the resurrection at that point. Um, so please don't feel any uh, obligation to stay during this first half. Again, it is graphic to talk about Christ's crucifixion. So again, once we get into the mix and match, if you'd like to step out or skip ahead, you're more than welcome to. Uh, after we go through the crucifixion, uh, we're going to go through seven reasons to believe that Jesus rose apart from the Bible. Um, so a lot of times we go through scriptural evidence, and that's incredible. That's the firm foundation that we have. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit, which comes from the Word. Uh, we also have faith that comes outside of that, that helps give testimony to the things that we believe being true. Uh, so hopefully that'll be a blessing and especially help with those that may not have the same faith that we have. As far as sources, if you want to dive in deeper, um, I did have the opportunity to reread uh, The Lynchpin. I read a whole book just for this uh, particular message, as well as a huge chunk of The Case for Christ a few times. Uh, other ones would be uh, a video. It's about a half hour. This is where I got the evidence of the crucifixion. Um, this is from a medical point of view, so that's a great video if you want to look more into the crucifixion. And then just the movies. Most of us have heard of The Passion of the Christ, if not seen it. Uh, there's also the Son of God movie, which I believe came out in 2014. It's an excellent uh, rendering of Christ's entire life. Um, it's kind of like the chosen compact into just one movie. Uh, so just quick recap. Uh, these are the weeks we've gone through so far. It really happened. Hurt people hurt people and loved people love well. When we realize how loved we are, we want to be in his presence. And by being in Jesus' presence, we become a present to others. Uh, third is God qualifies you. We talked about how man wants to qualify us, disqualify us at times, like Peter cutting off the high priest's ear, saying you're no longer worthy of your position. And Christ comes up and even restores the worthiness of his enemies. Fourth, we see the Chapel of the Holy Sepulchre, my personal favorite location. Um, talk a little bit more about that. And this week is Jesus really died and he really rose. So at this time, if you do want to step out for the medical part uh, of the crucifixion, because it is a little bit graphic, uh, not so much in the pictures we'll show, except for the nail marks and the feet, uh, but more so just in how it's described. And uh, so if you want to step out and head into the commons, I'll have someone come and uh, bring you back when we talk about the resurrection. Uh, at this time, if you want to partner up, um, you can talk a little bit about your weekend if you want to. Uh, otherwise, try to match up what or I know how it goes. Um, try to match up what order these events happened in. Time is yours. Um, feel free to keep talking. I'm going to start passing this around. It's uh, Jesus' final week. Um, really helpful diagram of where the events happened. All right, if you get your answers ready, let's see how you did. So the order that we see the events happen is the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and we're going to go again into the medical side of this. Uh, Jesus before Pilate, um, the scourging, the flogging. And the crown of thorns and the beating, um, those can be swapped depending on which gospel you read. The important thing is that this is being written from a theological perspective and not so much a historical perspective. And so the general idea is what's most important in the events being captured. Uh, we also see the crucifixion, and then I just left resurrection events so that, you know, if you weren't sure, hopefully we got something. <laughs> Why are we going through um, the apologetics, defending the faith so much? Uh, it's because there's things such as the swoon theory, 
uh, there's a lot of arguments against the Christian faith. And there's times when we go, I, I don't really know if it's smart to be a Christian. I don't know if my faith is really in a great spot. Um, because we hear people like um, people from the faith that have the Quran as their holy book that say, well, Jesus didn't really die. Um, others will say, well, Jesus, you know, he fled to India or Egypt. You know, he got married. He had a whole other life. In fact, we think we know his, where his bones are. We have a grave somewhere else in a different country. You know, he really didn't die. In fact, um, when he said, I thirst, and they took the spear and gave him the sponge and he drank something, he was probably being given a drug. And then, you know, the cold, damp air of the tomb, that kind of revived him and brought him back. Um, so, you know, he probably didn't really die. And the Quran says this specifically, um, the citation at the bottom. Uh, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, though it was made to appear like that to them. Those that disagreed about him were full of doubt. And so we see this different perspective. And so when you're presented with us, I just want us to have another angle, Scripture being the primary one. This is just a secondary one that can be really helpful to look at. All these events really happened. He really died, and he really rose. Uh, if somebody could read for us uh, the quote from Luke twenty-two forty-four, please. Being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. All right. So the skeptics tend to have a field day with this one, and they go, really? Drops of blood? He sweat blood? And you're just trying to say he anguished, and you know, you're trying to emphasize what he did? Okay, well, that's definitely not true, right? Well, as it actually happens to be from a medical perspective, uh, this is a very rare condition. Um, there's only been about 12 to 14 cases reported worldwide, and it only happens to people in extreme stress or agony. And so you might go, well, why would somebody who is crucified being Jesus and not somebody else being crucified experience this? You've got to remember it's not just the physical, I know I'm going to be crucified, but also the spiritual, I'm bearing the weight of your sin and mine the sin of the whole world. I mean, that's extreme stress, extreme agony, knowing exactly what he would go through. Um, the diagram, I think, might be a helpful picture. Uh, as you look at some of the blood being passed through that's connected to the sweat glands, um, when you get too warm, um, we sweat to try to cool off some of the blood. And so inside of the capillaries, uh, inside of the sweat glands has capillaries, uh, and those constrict when we're stressed. Uh, his constricted so much or dilated so much that they would have burst. And when those ruptured, um, a small amount of blood, this wasn't a crazy amount, but that would have gotten into uh, the sweat. And so he would have had a sheen of blood with uh, his sweat. And why is that important? Uh, partially because as we look at the flogging that was going to happen, when you go through this medical phenomenon, uh, it makes the skin really tattered and frail. Um, so it'd be more likely to be broken open easily through uh, the flogging. Um, two quick side notes. Um, one, uh, the sheets that are along the side, I forgot to pass those out last time. I mentioned we we're going to and then I just never did. There are a lot there. Um, you can use these as bookmarks in your Bible. You can hang them up places. You can hand them out. Um, these are all hand selected for this class for each of you. Um, so I personally found them, printed them off, um, brought them out here. So hopefully they're a blessing to you. If there's any that you like, grab as many as you want. Um, they're just a resource for you. Um, so if you want to just help pass those along, once you see one gets down to the end, maybe then pass down the next one and also to the sides. And the second quick note <laughs> is that these slides are a little bit nicer at the beginning. As we get into it, I kind of broke all the rules of PowerPoint. There is so much text on these slides. I promise you I tried condensing and highlighting as much as I could, but there's just a lot of information. So I apologize. There's, there's just so much coming at you this morning. It's going to be kind of like that fire hose week. Um, there's a lot of research that went into this. Jesus before Pilate. Uh, would somebody mind reading this off for us? Peter denied Jesus three times. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters, the praetorium. It was early morning. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? Thank you. Appreciate it, Debbie. So just a quick recap. Remember we talked about observation, interpretation, application questions? Just a very few easy, quick observation questions. Uh, who, whose house are we talking about here? The high, priest. the high priest who was Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, what's the picture in the lower left? If you remember, it's a bone box, an ossuary. Whose bone box specifically? 
Caiaphas. So this is very likely Caiaphas's bone box. All right, this isn't just a random person in history. This is a real person, and we ha probably have his bones. <laughs> and by the way, I think this is hilarious. I had the opportunity to go to an art museum with my sister recently. Um, have you ever seen the Monet paintings? Beautiful paintings. And then in the corner, he just scratches in his name. Um, that's what the bone box is. <laughs> Beautiful, you know, whole, really well done. And then just Caiaphas on the side. Um, and then up top, uh, anyone remember what this is? We saw a video on this one of the previous weeks. This is where Peter denied Christ and Jesus was probably standing. This looks like the inside of a museum today because it is. <laughs> um, but that was probably the wealthy man's house, um, the same house that we're talking about here. And then later in the verse, we talked about Pilate went outside and said to them, remember, anyone remember what this is? This is the Pontius Pilate stone. I believe it was discovered in about 1961, certainly in Caesarea, Philipp or Caesarea Maritima, uh, right along the coastline of the Mediterranean. Uh, again, proof that Pontius Pilate is a real person. Okay, and uh, just a quick recap, uh, just so you have the location of where we talk about. Again, we're moving into the crucifixion. Again, please don't feel uh, any sort of obligation to stay through this portion. If you do want to step out, um, it's more than welcome. Um, so again, we're talking about Golgotha, which is likely this location, which was outside of the city walls in Jesus's day. The walls adapted about 10 years after, but in Jesus's day, he was outside of the city walls. So scourging. Uh, would somebody mind reading this? Uh, we, I did a compilation of multiple passages together, so you got the fullest picture I could help us paint. If somebody wouldn't mind reading this for us. I have found in him no guilt deserving death. Then Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, who committed insurrection, uprising, and murder, and scourged and flogged Jesus. Okay, so this is the picture of them flogging Christ. Um, and I want us, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the flogging in a moment. Uh, but as far as the event actually, who was released in Jesus' place? Barabbas. Barabbas. What would be a good personal application of you can pick Jesus or you can pick somebody else to be released? I, I just want to think in your own life. Um, one of the best sermons that I heard was by uh, Dr. Jason Lane at Concordia, Wisconsin. And he said, whatever you honor in life, whatever you try to put a crown on, it won't bleed for you. Instead, it'll just bleed you dry. And so Barabbas in this case, you might pick him and you might think, well, this is the one we want to release. This is the one we're going to put our money on. But he's not going to do anything good for you. And if there's something in your life, some sin struggle, and you're going, oh, I could pick this or I could pick Jesus. That sin struggle, it might give you some sort of temporary relief and comfort, but it won't bleed for you like Jesus would. And so this idea of, well, how could they ever do that? Well, <laughs> we have a tendency to do something similar. So scourging. Uh, scourging was an awful uh, practice. It was so terrible that Roman citizens were actually exempt. They wouldn't allow them to be flogged. And we saw this with Paul. Hey, I'm a Ro Roman citizen. You can't treat me this way, uh, which he was using for the gospel's benefit. So as far as how it happened, um, you might be wondering, well, how would Jesus just not bleed out from this? Um, this again happened when, if we go back, it was early morning. And so the air was still probably cool. And so we would have seen the blood loss be more minimal. Um, this was largely public mocking and embarrassment. I mean, later we're going to see the garments of Jesus being divided and then gambled for. Um, I don't know if you've ever played Foursquare when you were younger, um, but one of the ways of gambling was they would roll dice onto something like that and gamble for them in that way. But the flogging often happened um, with the victim being naked to show that just they were a criminal and just embarrass them. And they would be whipped from the back of the arms all the way down the back, the buttocks, back of the legs, down to the heels. Um, so it was the whole body. And this is the pattern that we saw. It would happen from two guards, one standing on either side, uh, doing the scourging. As far as the whip itself, um, it was usually about an 18-inch long wooden handle. And it had nine leather thongs on it. They were of substantial length. And they had uh, metal and broken off pieces of bone. Um, the metal was used if you're a fisherman. <laughs> Um, the sinker, right, that weight, that would be caused to press into the skin and then the bone would be to tear away. And so oftentimes the back would be 
uh, exposed all the way down to the spine. Um, some of the skeletal muscle would come out and then birds might come up and pick at it. Um, it was a terrible, terrible process. Um, each of the cuts, by the way, I didn't realize this. This kind of shocked me when I did the research on it. Um, so they're about two inches long and about three quarter to an inch deep uh, lacerations. Uh, so each one of these, one of the leather thongs would probably cause about 20 stitches. Multiply that times the nine leather thongs that were attached to the whip. You're looking at probably about 180 stitches for one lashing to close up all of those lacerations. And then you do that 39 times because Jewish practice, you normally wouldn't do 40, you would do one less. Just go right up to the maximum. Sometimes they did more, but here uh, we'd see it'd probably take about 2,000 stitches just to close up what was going on Jesus' back. And I mention that because before we even get into the crucifixion, he's already in a critical state. So the crucifixion, um, just to mention one of the things that we just mentioned with flogging and then later a medical condition he would go into. Uh, he's probably in hypovolemic shock. Uh, hypo meaning low volume of blood, so he's probably low on blood. Uh, and this causes a few things. It causes fainting, although we don't have any recordings of Jesus losing consciousness. He probably did not. Uh, but he did collapse with the cross after carrying it. And it also causes uh, things in the bladder to change. Basically, you become very thirsty. And so this is where we see Jesus say, I thirst. Uh, and then later in the crucifixion, um, which I'm jumping ahead a little bit, there would be respiratory acidosis, which carbon, mono, carbon dioxide would be released into the blood. And so he would have known right before he was about to die, which is going to be helpful when we talk about the later verse with, I lay my di life down freely in John 10. So the beating. Uh, if someone wouldn't mind reading this compilation verse. spit on him and took the reed and struck him in the head, on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on and led him away to crucify him. This is surprisingly not my prop. Um, so please be careful with it. <laughs> um, this is from the church. Um, just to give you an idea of what the crown of thorns um, looked like and feels like, just to experience it in another tangible way. Um, again, this was probably Christ's thorn. You got a chance to hold some of the Christ's thorn from Israel. Uh, it was much smaller. These uh, spikes normally would be about uh, one and a half to two inches long. And something that struck me, because I tried making a crown of thorns out of the Christ thorn I had. It was too brittle and too dry. Um, but it causes a lot of pain to hurt someone else in that way. It was a three to four foot long uh, read that they probably would have woven together. Um, but just trying to twist it myself, I, <laughs> I got a lot of splinters. And then I very wisely put it on the bus seat next to me. And when I came back, uh, I probably looked like a Tom and Jerry moment, just jumping up from sitting on the thorns. Um, but it, it's a very painful process, even with the small ones. I can't imagine with the much longer thorns. Um, two things I didn't know about the crown of thorns previously was that um, they would tap down the crown of thorns and they would actually use a reed to push it down further onto the head. And this would cause about 300 to 400 puncture marks uh, on top of this, probably going into the skull. Um, and again, just two separate ideas. Jesus didn't die of shock or blood loss. Um, we see throughout the gospel accounts that he maintained consciousness and coherent speech. As far as the beating, again, something I probably didn't really think about. You see it a little bit in the Passion of the Christ. Um, but after being beaten in the face, um, Jesus' eyes probably were swollen shut. So you couldn't clearly see at that point. His nose was probably tearing, uh, pouring blood. And although uh, being struck, you'd think, well, his jawbone probably would have broken. Um, his teeth might have gotten knocked loose. But again, none of his bones were broken. A uh, crucifixion itself. This isn't typically how we would picture a cross. And again, it could be the traditional one that we think about. Um, this is just a helpful diagram of one of the possibilities. Uh, so a lot of us probably have had kids, um, or when you were younger, as a kid, you might have stayed up and pulled an all-nighter. Um, that feeling that next day of just being exhausted, um, Jesus was probably awake for about 36 hours prior to the crucifixion. 
Um, so just that fatigue on top of it. And just being an early riser, it often said that Jesus would go to a desolate place to pray early in the morning. Um, so there's just a lot of lack of sleep going on there. Uh, and there was also a lot of walking, um, but probably about two and a half miles through the old city of Jerusalem. And he probably carried, uh, you see this cross beam up here, it's called the patibulum, um, the horizontal beam. That's probably what he carried as opposed to the entire cross through the Via Della Rosa, the way of the rose, the way of agony. Um, he probably carried that about a third of a mile before collapsing. And that <coughs> patibulum by itself um, oftentimes didn't just weigh 75 to 125 pounds. It probably weighed about 125 to 150 pounds. Either way, extremely heavy. And having already been scourged and beaten, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to bear that, as well as the wood. If you're going to crucify someone with it, it's probably not some polished, stained, finished wood. It's probably very rough, um, especially on skin that's already been exposed to the elements. The vertical beam was often fixed into the ground already. And so um, when we talk about the nail marks, uh, a helpful way to visualize the terrible process is they would lay the victim on the ground uh, horizontally uh, with the horizontal beam and then nail in the nails. Afterwards, they might use a pitchfork or a rope to help lift up the cross beam and actually attach it to the vertical, uh, the seat aisle, uh, vertical beam. And you can imagine when that happened and you got dropped into the location, dropped into the ground, that's where you might see the bones going out of joint, which we see in Psalm 22. Again, so many prophecies fulfilled. I can't mention them all, um, but there are so many that point to Christ, like Psalm 22, verse 14. Uh, it says, my bones are out of joint. I can count all of my ribs, which you could do in that position of being crucified. As far as the nail marks in the hands, uh, in Hebrew, the hand includes, I've seen all the way down to about an inch below the wrist, um, all the way down to here. So Hebrew for hand isn't just the part that we think with our language in English. Uh, it included a little bit more. And most likely the crucifixion probably happened with the nail marks going in about an inch below because the Romans realized this can actually support the weight of an entire person. Uh, if it was just in the hands, it would probably tear the flesh and it wouldn't be able to support him. It's possible that they used ropes to help hold him up there. Um, but I would personally think it's most likely um, through the wrists that he was crucified. Uh, in, in doing so, again, the Romans were experts in killing. And so they probably missed the radial and ulnar arteries. They missed a lot of the blood vessels so it would minimize blood loss. They didn't want them to just bleed out. They wanted them to suffer. And so not just die immediately. And that's probably crushed the medium nerve. Um, if I could give the uh, example, uh, you ever hit your funny bone? Uh, one of the illustrations was it'd be like taking a pliers and crushing that. That's crushing the median nerve. That's that feeling. It's like a cattle prod continually. And it causes, if you know anyone that has carpal tunnel, it causes the hand to tense up. So his hand was probably clenched up at that moment. And this was actually such a painful process that they had to invent a new word for it. And so they invented the word excruciating, which means out of the cross. Uh, just a quick warning if you do want to look away. Um, this is probably one of the more graphic photos, although it's appropriate enough that I included it. Um, so the nail marks in the feet. Uh, this caused minimal blood loss again. Uh, again, they're expert killers, so they avoided the veins and avoided the arteries as much as possible. And probably went between the first and second metatarsal, uh, which you can see in this graphic right here. And it hits the plantar nerves, much like the median nerve. Uh, this causes an extraordinary amount of pain, excruciating pain. And I found this fascinating. Um, and this is just such a key theme. So if you want to grab onto something, this is a great takeaway. Harvard, would you call them a you know, place you'd want your kids to go to, right? Like, yeah, my kid went to Harvard. Yeah, that's great. They went to Yale. Oh, cool. Um, very reputable, very good. And you have a place like Harvard that used to say, well, there's no evidence that Jesus died from nail marks. It was only ropes that were used. The crucifixion couldn't have been done that way, so it's an invalid method of killing. So the accounts aren't true. This is from Harvard. And yet, archaeological evidence later shows our faith to be true. So even if it doesn't agree immediately and you're going, oh, I don't know how to reconcile this. Oh, it's too much. Harvard's disagreeing. Give it a little time. The Lord often shows us 
supporting evidence for our faith. And so in 1968, this right here, I've had the opportunity to see this, um, is actually a bone uh, with a diagram of how this would have been nailed going through the foot. Um, so it's another method if they were nailed to the side of the cross versus through those metatarsals on the front if they were crucified forward versus through the side of the foot. Point being, nails were used in crucifixion. Uh, and then as far as uh, no bones were broken, oftentimes victims could suffer up to six days on the cross. Um, and so they would come up and repeatedly hit the shin bones until those broke um, or different bones so that you couldn't continually push up to breathe. Because when you're in this position, you're in an inhale position, but you have to push up and scrape your back against that rough cross in order to take a breath in. And so they would break the legs in order to have them die. A few interesting points about that. One, the words that Jesus says on the cross, extraordinarily valuable. They took him in a great deal of pain to say. And so that's why often you see the words that he says in very short sentences, about three to four words because it would take that exertion to exhale, to speak. And the other thing is, Jesus was a carpenter, probably a stonemason as well with his father Joseph. He had no real reason to die at this point. He was in good shape. Why would he die in about six hours and not six days? Well, the interesting point with that is that he laid down his life freely. If somebody wouldn't mind reading this passage for us. My life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Awesome. Thank you. Who takes Jesus' life? Nobody. Nobody. I lay it down freely. All right, this is, again, Jesus' authority. It, he didn't take all this time to die because he knew when he was about to, and he gave his life up to the Lord. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then after his death, they wanted to confirm it. And so they used the spear and pierced his side, uh, which a lot of us know, but more specifically, um, he'd already probably been dead for about 30 to 60 minutes to see the phenomenon that we're about to describe happen. Um, and it also, again, there's so many prophecies. I can only mention a few for a limited time. Uh, but Zechariah 12.10, uh, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. So he was already dead when they pierced him in the side. And you probably could take even a shot today to the uh, left side of your body. But if you take it to the right side, that's where it's very deadly. And uh, the Romans probably would have gone between uh, where you see seven and eight on the diagram. That's probably the ribs between uh, where the spear would have gone up and through because this would have pierced through the lung, through the heart, and into the spine. Again, they're expert killers. And so if you're thinking, well, why are we being so graphic? You know, why are we even talking about this? Again, people believe Jesus didn't really die. And one of the things the skeptics have a very hard time disputing is, well, even if he somehow swooned on the cross and didn't really die, no one could have survived that spear wound. Plus, if you're a Roman guard and you let a prisoner escape, that's your life on the line. Right? So there's a lot going on here to show that the death really did happen of Christ. And it says blood and water flowed out of his side. Uh, there's a fluid that would have developed around his lungs and around his heart that when he was pierced, blood and water would have come out. And it would have been in the order of water and blood. And so some people take issue and they go, well, the English says blood and water. So obviously John didn't know what he was talking about. The emphatic thing is said first. There was more blood than water. So in Greek, that's what's mentioned first. <laughs> a lot of details here. Uh, Psalm 22:14. Uh, again, all, so many prophecies. Um, this is just one that I happened to study a lot recently for a sermon for tables, so that's why I'm quoting it a lot. Uh, but he says, I was poured out like water. My heart is like wax. It melts within me. Um, so again, this spear wound. And we also see that my mouth is dried up. And that's where he says, I thirst. We're already in the graphic stuff. Um, the sponge that was probably used was not likely... Uh, something that was used for Jesus' benefit. This was probably further mocking when he said, I thirst. Um, these sponges, they didn't have toilet paper. They had to use something. So there's just so much that happens that we don't necessarily think about when it comes to Christ's humiliation for us. Crucifixion itself. Uh, again, we saw this diagram of Golgotha. Uh, again, it's on Mount Calvary. 
Uh, again, this is a road outside of the city walls, a place that many people would come by to see. This is the example of what not to do. Don't be a heretic. Don't be somebody that we think is one anyway. And if it's in the sepulcher, which is where I'm led to believe personally, although the crucifixion is less uh, certain, um, this is where it would be within there. And if it is today, um, this is Golgotha, if so. This is Mount Calvary down here. Uh, but interestingly, if, if this was not an earthquake, we talked about Matthew 27, 52, 53. There's darkness over the land. The earth was split. Bodies came out of the tombs. If this was not an earthquake, some experts say, well, this is a quarry mark. And it's stone that the builders rejected because they didn't want to use something that was cracked like that. It was what? The stone the builders rejected. Oh, this still points to Christ. All right. Graphic stuff over. I just want to show Jesus really did die because he did not just faint. He didn't just fake it. Um, if he really did die, that makes the resurrection all the more powerful. So I want to go through some logical and historical reasons from an intellectual standpoint that it's reasonable to believe that Jesus came back from the dead. It really happened. Uh, it's <laughs> somewhat silly to just say, well, I believe because I think it's true. It's a good place to start, and Christ does reward childlike faith. But as we continue in our faith, we want to go deeper. And they, a lot of these are quotes from the linchpin from Dr. Tom Zelt. And he says, I'm a believer in Jesus because I'm convinced that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, why is he so convinced that Jesus really rose? And why should we even bother with apologetics? Why not just only go to scripture? I think scripture is helpful, and if that's the only place you go, it's completely sufficient. But why should we go here? Because Thomas did. Um, and so did all of the other disciples. We call him Doubting Thomas. Well, <laughs> some of the other disciples are the same way. Uh, Mary, for instance, was weeping, thinking that the body was stolen. The two disciples decided the whole situation was too dicey, so they left. The rest of the disciples just thought Jesus was a ghost until he ate in front of them. So there's a lot of thought that, well, I don't know if Jesus is really true, that he really came back from the dead. And so Thomas is really no different. So you can call him Thomas the willing to say everything that everyone else was thinking, or Thomas the scientist, or Thomas late to the table. But he was using his rational mind, the gift that God had given him, to process what the Lord had done for him. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, just I want to give us some pictures throughout to break up some of the quotes and also just keep in mind this is what we're talking about with the resurrection. So the linchpin. This is something I've been saving. This is something that if you go in the Vicarage basement, um, it was totally apart already. I didn't take this off. Um, <laughs> this here is a linchpin. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus is the linchpin in understanding God. If there is no resurrection, the wheels of Christianity entirely come off. The whole thing of let's talk about Jesus being God incarnate, forgiveness, the authority of the Bible, the importance of the Bible, life after death. It is all a waste of time if Jesus didn't actually rise. So the idea here is that Christ is the linchpin. If you pull out what he did in the resurrection, everything else in our faith falls apart. There's no reason to believe everything else that happened. Oh, so what? A baby was born in Jerusalem and he claimed to be God. Good for him. If he didn't really come back from the dead, so what? He died on the cross. He's some, one of so many others. But since he really died and really came back from the dead, now all of our faith is held together by the event of something that actually happened. The resurrection of Jesus is the linchpin that holds all of our faith together. I brought it all the way out here, so I'm going to pass it around. Um, <laughs> I should have asked for one. These are the seven reasons we're going to clip through. Uh, if you feel like this is a lot, just think of the poor congregation back in Wisconsin. We did this in a quarter of a sermon. So I probably shouldn't have done that, but we're, <laughs> we're going to clip through this. Uh, the seven reasons. And uh, if anyone would like, I can make this one of the printouts that we're passing along, and I hope those are a blessing to you. Um, but number one, movement has a cause. Two, if you know you're lying, you're not going to die for something. You're not going to get in trouble for something that you know is a lie. 
the Jewish writings actually support the resurrection, the chapel of the Holy Sepulchre being the geographical real place that this happened. There's a major shift from Sabbath to Sunday, from monotheism to Trinitarian. There's an early Christian creed that developed months after Christ rose from the dead. And the details convey accuracy. All right, movement has a cause. I was going to bring in a basketball and just throw it, but then somebody's like, no, you're <laughs> going to hit somebody sleeping. So <laughs> movement doesn't just start. It has to have something that pushes it. There needs to be a mover, an event that happened. And so in this case, where did the movement start? Jerusalem. What caused this movement? There was a claim that Jesus was the Messiah, which was validated, proved to be true because he rose from the dead. Now, could that claim be wrong? I mean, maybe. Right? If somebody's still skeptical and you're talking to them about this, you can say, maybe you are right. Maybe Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. But something happened. Something was so significant that we saw this movement begin at the time that Jesus was claimed to rise from the dead. And this happened again between 26 to 36 A.D., and a Jewish quote says that there's a new and mischievous belief that happened about a Messiah. Something caused riots. Something caused people to believe in Jesus rising from the dead enough that they risked losing their homes and their businesses. I mean, imagine losing your home or your business because you're saying Jesus really rose. And so it can't be denied that something or someone so significant influenced the disciples to take all of these risks. Movement has a cause. And we also see this in the book of Acts. Uh, I love this because our faith is not just based on some fantasy or hope. It's based on actual events that caused our faith. And so at the beginning of Acts, Jesus showed himself alive to the men, showing that there were many proofs that he was alive. And there's no other reason to believe in him other than we saw him die and now we see that he's alive again. And if this really happened, the places, the names, and the settings should be consistent with what we know about from Jerusalem, from these places and times. Remember this? Where is this from? It's a tomb. What are the little dots? A whole bunch of flies, right? This is where Dr. Zelt went down in there and took that video for us so we could see what the resurrection site looks like. Number two, if you know that you're lying... (laughs) you're probably not going to take the fall for something that you know was a lie. Uh, And not only take the fall, but actually be killed for it. And so maybe there would be one or two disciples, if the resurrection didn't really happen, that would give their life and try to start something. But there's nothing in it for them. (laughs) They weren't promised some mansion. They weren't promised some benefit. It was just whippings, lashings, and death. I mean, why would you lie about that if there is no earthly reward for it? Obviously, they thought there was some greater picture going on. Uh, John was the only one that we believe died from a natural death on the island of Patmos after he wrote the book of Revelation, uh, which I don't know if that's any better being in solitary confinement. But so again, if they were all knew that they were lying, which they would have known because they saw Jesus, if they saw him all bloody and bruised, they would go, okay, he's, (laughs) I'm not going to die believing that he came back from the dead. That's a silly claim. And so Some people might say, well, I mean, if somebody just dies for their faith, I mean, you see people of other faiths give their lives and become martyrs. Surely then, I mean, how is Christianity any different? You can't use martyrdom as an argument. You can if unlike in the caves that Muhammad went into, which was an intellectual experience only in his mind that others didn't actually see in physical reality, this is a different sort of event. So Christian martyrs are different in that there's verifiable, for, verifiable first-generation eyewitnesses. Say that a few times fast. Um, their faith was based on what they'd seen, on what they'd touched, on the meals they had with Christ after he came back from the dead, on the walks they had with him from the road to Emmaus. Their faith wasn't just based on, well, I hope he's back, but they saw him back. So how the disciples died, we're not going to go through this whole thing. I was advised that's not a good idea. But there was a lot of stoning, beheading, whipping, uh, prolonging, even X-shaped crosses or upside-down crosses, um, stoning that would happen by pushing them into a pit, having them just be injured, and then throwing stones. Why would they throw stones? You ever hear that song with the Grinch? I wouldn't even touch him with a 40-foot pole. These people are so awful, I'm not even going to touch them. I'm just going to throw stuff at them. 
That's what stoning was all about. It was about trying to get so far away, I'm not even going to touch this. If you know someone who doesn't believe in the resurrection, it must be admitted that there is some group that was willing to be horrendously killed and suffer for the sake of believing that Jesus rose rather than deny it. And so there had to be something that caused that deep-seated conviction. So Jewish writings. I find this interesting. I'm not going to go into all the details. They're up on the screen if you want to take a picture. (laughs) Be my guest. Um, But I'm just trying to show you all of this is well-researched and documented. Uh, What's really cool about this is that we have a positive witness from a hostile source. If you don't agree with someone, you're probably not going to back it up. But if it's true, even the evidence and the details of trying to deny it, if you have siblings and they start arguing and they make up some fake story, that fake story is going to have some facts in it that help verify the actual truth. And so when you examine some of the writings of the Jewish traditions, we see that the resurrection really happened. Um, This one is from the writings above. And this is what's said. On the eve of Passover, when was Jesus crucified? Passover, so the date is correct. Yeshu, Jesus, was hanged, which is just an execution term. And for 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he is going uh, forth to be stoned because he practiced what? Why is that so cool? Come back to that. He practiced sorcery. That's exactly right. (laughs) And he enticed Israel to apostasy. You know, if anyone can say anything in his favor, come forward. Uh, But no one defended Jesus. And this again happened on the eve of Passover. What does this tell us? I'm just going to summarize this. You can (laughs) read it all if you'd like. Again, I broke all the rules for PowerPoint. I apologize. (laughs) Jesus was a real person. He was executed by the Jews. Uh, He was well-known, and the religious leaders want him killed. This is probably one of my favorite things out of all the Jewish writings. They said he practiced sorcery. They're going, well, you can't believe in Jesus because, well, I mean, he did healings by devils. From from Beelzebub, he casts out demons. All right, he's not a credible guy. He's a bad guy. He uses demon power. He uses demon what? (laughs) Power. He practiced sorcery. This validates that Jesus was doing miracles. And part of the reason for this, there was a difference between we're going to do a slate of hand card tricks, right? And there's actual magic or sorcery happening here. And that's the language that was used. There was some sort of magic that Jesus was doing, some miracles. And miracles point to Jesus being God. Happen at the right time. You receive no help. And basically, why would the Jews go through and write this? I mentioned the example of like two siblings fighting and them creating a false story. They thought he was a heretic. So they wanted to take credit for saying we killed the heretic right because if you really thought somebody was claiming to be god in the flesh you'd want to take them out you'd want to say we we took care of that guy that's why they're taking credit for this Uh, also in the toledo theesu another jewish writing the point of this one is that they validate the empty grave because they say well somebody ran up they saw that it was an empty grave we got to come up with a story show what really happened and so they say well we remove the body And we took Jesus' body, we tied his feet, and we dragged him with a horse throughout the town. We showed he's not really alive, he's just dead. If that happened, Christians probably wouldn't be believing in Jesus to the point of dying for him. And there would be accounts of this event that actually happened. So in trying to make some contention of, well, Jesus didn't really uh, come back from the dead, they showed that the tomb was empty. Chapel of the Holy Sepulchre. Um... Just want to give you this resource quick. Um, I think I showed you with these in a previous week. Um, but this is what the inside of the Chapel of the Holy Sepulcher actually smells like today. So just another way to touch, see, taste, smell the connection with Jesus really rising from the dead. A lot of details here. I went into such a deep rabbit hole. I looked at like several books on the sepulcher and I'm like, I'm not going to share all that. One thing I do want to share is in the Syrian chapel, which if you remember that diagram on the far left side, uh, there were these chapels right in alongside Jesus' tomb. And in that fire that happened in the 1800s, it cracked some of the rock they excavated and found tombs that were 2,000 years old. I thought it was really cool that these tombs couldn't have been made seven years, ten years past Jesus' death, because at that time, that's when the walls were expanded. And you can't bury dead inside of the Jewish uh, walls. And so it's just a place that shows 
This has never been rebuilt or excavated. It's just right here. These are tombs right next to Jesus' tomb. Uh, just love this picture. <laughs> cave wall on the left. I just I went on such a rabbit hole, and I'm like, man, I found pictures without the cave wall being excavated in 2016. Really cool. And then the burial bed of Christ, where he likely came back from the dead. All right, why are you here this morning? If you're sleeping, here's your wake-up call. Why are you here this morning? Like, why today specifically? You see, Jews used to worship on Saturdays. If you go to Israel today, one of people's favorite stories to tell when they visit Israel is that if it's Sabbath, if it's Saturday, do not take the Shabbat elevator. (laughs) Because if you do, it'll stop on every floor because they take the Sabbath so seriously that even pushing a button could cause a spark, which could light a flame, which you can't do on Sabbath. So there's no elevator button pushing. It just automatically goes down. That's just an example today. In Jesus' day and other times, the Sabbath was a capital offense if you didn't follow it properly, if you took too many steps. There's so many laws around it. This is a carefully guarded tradition. And the older things were, the more valid they were. They didn't like change like we do today. And so to make this major shift, something had to happen where all of a sudden Jews started worshiping on Sunday. When was Jesus resurrected? On Sunday. This is the Lord's Day. And by the way, if people say, well, Jesus wasn't really in the tomb for three days. You know, he's only in there Friday evening through Saturday and Sunday morning. That's not three days. Well, Jews counted one full day for each partial day. So they counted it differently than we do. And I also thought this was really cool. Um, I did so much research throughout the whole week. These were just thrown in at midnight last night as I re-listened to some of the chapters and read them. Uh, There's a shift from monotheism. Uh, Deuteronomy 6. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. Huge focus on monotheism to all of a sudden we're worshiping Jesus as God himself. Something had to shift this. And also... If you're celebrating communion, communion is what? Christ's body and blood. If he didn't really rise from the dead, why would you create a practice celebrating that your teacher died? If he didn't really rise, why is there any sort of celebration that he died? Same thing with baptism. You look at Romans 6. We were therefore buried with Christ, and if we've been buried with him, we will also rise with him. Wait, wait, wait. If he didn't really rise from the dead, why would we celebrate baptism, which just focuses on Jesus died? Again, these practices only make sense in light of the resurrection. Outside of the sepulcher, early Christian creed. Uh, This is a powerful argument um, that's throughout most of Christian apologetics. Uh, And so a lot of people will say, well, you know, All those ideas about Jesus being God, I mean, those developed over hundreds of years, like the first 200 years, and eventually they started saying, well, Jesus was a really good teacher. Um, And then maybe maybe he really did do some of these miracles. And then later you'd see this development of, okay, well, maybe he's a divine figure, and you see these golden pictures of his head being illuminated. So obviously it's just a tradition that developed over time. But if that claim is false, we should see immediately people saying, Jesus really rose from the dead, and that proves he's God. So what do we see? If somebody could read for us, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to the Cephas, then to the twelve. A lot of things going on here. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Just dive in. Like I said, we could really dive in. (laughs) Point is, from the most liberal estimations, this creed was written within 17 years of Jesus' resurrection. Why is that significant? Uh, Everybody believe Alexander the Great really lived, ruled? Nobody's going, oh, no, he really didn't. No, no, no. Alexander, we got a problem there. When was the writings for Alexander written? 400 years after the dude died. And it's still considered valid. In fact, it's in history books. 400 years. When was this written? Likely within two to five years. I just threw that out there to satisfy people that have later dating. In reality, this was formulated within months of Jesus' resurrection. 
This was a creed like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed that was spoken frequently. And we know it's a creed because he used the words received and delivered. This is stock wording. Uh, when we quote uh, this, what do we say? Four score and seven years ago. We don't say 87 years. Why? Because that's exactly how it was said. And so in this one, he says, I, was, I received this. It was delivered to me. He's saying this is a creed. This is just like the Gettysburg Address. And what does this creed teach us that was so early on? Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, rose on the third day, appeared a scene alive by Peter and the Twelve. Language we wouldn't normally use with Cephas and the Twelve. Not to mention that he appeared to over 500 people. There's no such thing as mass hallucinations. There's a lot going on there. But this happened very shortly after Christ's resurrection. We're on the same wavelength. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> think it. Um, seventh point, details convey accuracy. Um, and so, again, same thing. We talked about Harvard. Okay, it was, oh, my kid went to Harvard. That's so cool. Um, these valid, credible places sometimes will say, I don't know, if, if these things don't match exactly, then the account isn't necessarily credible. Yet, all the biblical sites that we have listed for Jesus' final week, the triumphal entry, all right, Hosanna, we grab the palm branches in church. The Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Temple Mount, I could just keep going. Uh, not one is out of place. This is from the linchpin. Every location of the story can be verified. Even when the details don't seem to agree at first glance, right, nobody's really been crucified with nails, they just use ropes. With what we know of certain customs, they have proven to be accurate. fly through this super quick. Uh, all of these details line up is the point with first century practices and other accounts. Jesus' tomb was close to where the cross is. We talked a lot about the sepulcher. Uh, it was owned uh, by Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, it's a new stone-cut tomb. And uh, the rolling stone by the entrance is about four to six feet because uh, it was noted that this was a large stone. So it's probably closer to six feet that rolled in front of it. Uh, it was wrapped, Jesus' body was wrapped uh, in a shroud with uh, multiple cloths and face coverings. Uh, he was buried on the day of preparation for Shabbat, which, again, we saw the Jewish writings confirm. Uh, he was wrapped in 75 pounds of spices. This was to help the stench, because he would come in and, again, take the bones, put them in ossuary, into a burial niche. And Jesus' body did not have decay, as was one of the prophecies. It was in a garden. And you could stand outside, look in, and see where the body was laid. There's a flat spot for the body, which we spent a lot of time talking about. And the women waited for the first day of the week to revisit the tomb. Right, people say, well, there was guards there. Why would they have come back? I mean, if your Lord was dead, wouldn't you want to go back even in the opportunity that there might be a chance to give those to Christ, to your Lord? And also, <laughs> I love when people point out, oh, you know, there's different discrepancies in how many women were there and when they came and things. Again, the core of this is what's important. And when they say, well, the women <laughs> were the ones there, uh, women in, in Jesus' day from Jewish sources were looked down upon, unfortunately. Jesus came to change that. That's not God's position. That's man's corrupt position. Uh, but even in this day, if this was a myth, they would have said, oh, well, Jesus floated out of the tomb and the guards were amazed and everyone saw this and there were all these crowds of men to witness this. That's not what we see. <laughs> we see the women at the tomb because that's what actually happened and God was trying to uplift a different social class that was being put down. Finally, the tomb was sealed uh, with wax or mud and that signet uh, probably would have been placed on the seal. Uh, also, <laughs> if the swoon theory was true that Jesus really was just faint, you know, and he was restored by the cold, damp air of the tomb. If you have nail marks through your feet, how would you walk the road of Emmaus? How would you use your arms if they were out of joint? And not to mention all of the wounds on his back and the spear wound in his side. Also, getting back to your point, Richard, um, how would people that were formerly opponents, such as Paul, right, who was formerly Saul, persecuting Christians to the point of death, or Jesus' brother who doubted him throughout his whole ministry. 
Imagine having a brother that doubted you the whole time. Um, how would they have changed their mind? If they saw Jesus in this state where he was just mangled, bloody, beaten, barely able to limp around, they would not call him the Lord of life. They would not change their mind and go, oh, you really are the Messiah. Unless he had come out in this majesty with just the whole holes in his wrist and his side, those scars. A few bonus indicators. I'll fly through these. Writings changed in the Dead Sea Scrolls after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, synagogues and the upper room formerly would point towards the temple. Right? For us, where's the sanctuary in here? If you could point. It would point here. But say Jesus' tomb was over here, then all of a sudden all the buildings started facing Jesus' tomb. Right? So something had to happen for that to change. And there was graffiti written on this, um, calling him conqueror, lord of life, the ruler. And this is just an example inside the sepulcher of 1,600-year-old graffiti. Uh, location of the tomb was well known. Um, they would have known what happened to the body. They can come back to the same location. And again, there's no fictional flowery narrative. When he appeared to the 500 uh, in the 12, mass hallucinations don't happen. So like, you can't just say, well, you know, they're all hallucinating. Um, the skeptics were converted. And there's both eyewitness and circumstantial, like crime scene evidence. We don't necessarily know what happened, but we see, well, there's a murder weapon, there's an intent, there's all of these things. We see both eyewitness accounts and circumstantial evidence. Uh, we're going to fly through these super quick. Uh, the other bonus indicators, these are lesser known Jewish writings that can be helpful. Uh, talks about the mischievous superstition from the first source, then from Josephus, uh, we see that he was perhaps alive, perhaps the Messiah. And from Pliny, I love this one. It says that they sang a hymn to Christ as to a God. You would not have done that in a monotheistic context unless Jesus really rose, proving that he is God. Quick review of the seven. Personal application. This is where we're going to wrap things up. Because Jesus really rose, he's no ordinary person. Uh, one of my Favorite quotes from my grandma before she passed. She would say, I belong to Jesus. He is my Lord and he is my God. Which is a direct quote from one of the Gospels. He's God in the flesh. And Easter makes Christmas believable and Christmas makes Easter inevitable. I love that because Easter is the most important historical holiday that happened for Christians. Again, if Jesus had just been born, it doesn't really matter. But because he rose... Of course he was born, and it makes it inevitable. God keeps his promises. If he can raise the dead, we can trust everything else in Scripture. Uh, and know that even death is not an insurmountable force for me and for you. And we still have accounts of people interacting with him today. Um, if you ever want to hear some of those personal stories or share those, I would love to hear those. And all authority is given to Jesus. If he has authority and dominion over death itself, then the words we see in the Bible, how he tells us this is how we should pray. This is how we should love God and love our neighbor. All of these things are words that we should treasure and keep. If he really is God himself, his words truly matter. And finally, he could have prevented his death. He could have called in legions of angels. He could have ran over that hill at Gethsemane as we saw, but he didn't out of love for you and for me. Even knowing all that he would suffer, sweating drops of blood, he persevered going, you're worth it. You're worth everything to me. Say a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for not abandoning us when we deserved it. Thank you for seeing us valuable enough to suffer everything you suffered on the cross. Thank you for leaving all of the evidence behind that you really rose from the tomb. Thank you for overcoming death for every person in here. In Jesus' name, amen.